and so she heads out and and then I'm scrambling to sort of reopen the congregation and uh, so thank you uh, for being so very patient with me and with the staff as we try to reopen the congregation, try to do that in a responsible way uh, and and make sure that we we do right by our confirmands. So God bless you all for being patient with us. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I wanted this moment because uh, every pastor does confirmation instruction a little differently. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I have my own sense of what I think is important uh, in confirmation. And I wanted to to give you a little overview of that, and, and by little, I mean really. It, we won't spend a lot of time talking about uh, what the next few weeks will look like. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, how many of, of you students are seventh graders? Seventh graders, raise your hand. How many are eighth? Okay. Are you eighth? Yeah. So, we have missed out on a pretty significant swath of time for faith formation. We got to have a little time in the fall, uh, and that was wonderful. But then things got real bad again in the winter, and we weren't able to gather. Now we've got this little bit of time here. It's an incredibly busy season where everybody has sports. But if I don't do it now, I'm terrified that it'll be well nigh impossible to get you all during the summer uh, in any significant numbers. And I know now why I'm missing and Wilson and Mifflin well enough that when you go into ninth grade, you eighth graders, man, you are just, you hit the ground running. You are crazily scheduled, extremely busy with sports and academics, uh, and there will be almost no hope of us trying to squeeze some more formation into the early fall before confirmation. So, so I just got to hit it hard. I got to hit it hard over these next six or seven weeks before Memorial Day. If you can hang in there with me, I am going to get you the basics of what I think you need to have to be able to say yes to your confirmation vow uh, in the fall, okay? So thank you all for being here. I want to start with a personal testimony. That is St. Anne Roman Catholic Church in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, that was, that is the congregation where I was baptized when I was a baby. Back in those days, you didn't get a lot of choice about which Catholic church you attended. You pretty much went to your neighborhood church. That was the expectation. So St. Anne's, it was St. Anne's or nothing. So we went to St. Anne's, a uh, real pretty place. Kind of reminds me a little bit of, uh, a little bit of atonement. A uh, very busy congregation. And my mom and dad, when they were 22 years old, went to the crusty old Irish priest who was the senior pastor of St. Anne uh, and said, hey, it is time to get Ryan baptized. Uh, here is my baptismal certificate, uh, Church of St. Anne in Tacoma, Washington. And I wanted to Here's a little close-up of that baptismal certificate. Uh, there's my name at the top. Dad's name, Leo. Mom's name. Mom and Dad were married uh, before they had me. Uh, it's just they include the maiden name for Mom. Tacoma, Washington. My birthday is September 7th of 76. And you see that I was baptized on October 8th of 77. Now, you would have no reason to know this, but uh, that's kind of a long time 
between the birth of a Catholic baby and the baptism of a Catholic baby, because in Catholicism, there's a pretty well-developed theology that if an infant dies, that infant goes to a place called limbo, which we Protestants don't believe in, but in Catholicism, that is a long-standing theological tradition. So normally, at about six months, Roman Catholic families get their babies splashed just in case something happens, uh, and they can be assured that that baby will not go to limbo, but will go into heaven. But you see that it took my folks almost a year. That is not because my folks uh, didn't make it a particularly high priority. It's because my folks went to the Catholic priest and said, it's time for us to get Ryan baptized, Father. Uh, how do we go about scheduling that? And the Catholic priest said, I can't baptize Ryan. And mom and dad said, why is that? And the priest said, you don't have a strong enough record of giving in the parish. So my mom and dad, at the age of 22, dad was in the army. Uh, mom was just out of cosmetolog cosmetology school. They didn't have any kind of money really at all, but they spent the next year or so trying to give whatever they could so that the Catholic priest would be satisfied that they were indeed committed, and finally they had a, a good enough record of giving that the priest uh, scheduled my baptism, but it was later than most Catholic babies get baptized, and the day of my baptism was the last day that they darkened the door of St. Anne Roman Catholic Parish. No surprise, right? That story has been told to me on a regular basis from my childhood on up. Uh, my mom, who was uh, born into Lutheranism, tells me that story, and Dad obediently nods his head in agreement, uh, as a way of, of teaching me about the importance of grace in religion. Uh, and that you, you don't buy Christianity. Uh, Christianity is always about grace. And, and that brings me to my thoughts about your confirmation. This year, Confirmation Sunday, our traditional Confirmation Sunday, is on the actual day of the beginning of the Reformation, Halloween morning. October 31st, Martin Luther went to the church in Wittenberg and nailed the 95 Theses on the front door of the church. That is the traditional day in this congregation for you to be confirmed, uh, for you to say yes to your own baptismal vows. Because of my personal experience uh, in my, my baptism, I want to tell you this, and I want you to listen. If you don't know anything about Jesus, Christianity, Lutheranism, atonement, your own personal take on all of that faith, if you don't know any of that, but you want to say yes, not because you get it all, but because you're willing to continue the journey. If you want to say yes on October 31st, I will confirm you, even if I have to tell you who that little man is hanging on the golden tee that people wear around their necks. 
because I believe in the power of grace. Grace saved me in my baptism, and if you want to say yes, I will let you say yes and make your confirmation on October 31st. Please hear that above anything else. Given the chaos of this last year, given the changes in pastoral staffing here at Atonement, uh, I, I feel like I could do nothing other than invite you to say your yes if you want to. I'm not going to force you to, but if you want to. That having been said, I am not a practitioner of cheap grace. I would like you to know some basic things about your religion. And we're going to send you home with a tool today so that you and your family can gauge whether you have some basic knowledge about your religion. Again, that's not, that's not to make you feel guilty. That's not because if you don't have it down, Ryan, Pastor Ryan is going to reject you from being able to make your confirmation. It's just because we make some important promises at baptism uh, and I would, be, I would be breaking my promise to you if I didn't try to give you some of this information, okay? So these are the words that were spoken at your baptism. They were spoken a little bit different, but they were spoken at my baptism too. First, the pastor or the priest asked your parents called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have your child baptized into Christ? And do you know what your parents said when the pastor or priest asked them that question? It's just like a wedding. They said, I do. They made a promise. Then the pastor or priest goes on. And this, this is usually the section when I'm doing a baptism where the baby starts wriggling and the mom and dad's eyes glaze over. You know, you can tell they're just like, oh, please don't start crying. And oh my gosh, please don't poop in the diaper. You know, it's that kind of thing. But these are, this is the next vow that your mom and dad made at your baptism. Pastor or the priest says, as you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities. So there's grace, but it's not cheap. There's responsibility that goes along with it. To live with them among God's faithful people. That means you participate in the life of the church. One good rule of thumb, I always tell my baptism families, if your kid doesn't know the pastor's name, that's a fairly good sign that you need to do a better job of living among God's faithful people. Bring them to the Word of God and the Holy Supper. That means you come to church, you hear a sermon, and you take Holy Communion. Teach them the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, that's the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments. Place in their hands the Holy Scriptures. That means gives you, give you a Bible. Nurture them in faith and prayer so that your child or children may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Church is not just about going to heaven and not going to hell. You join Jesus' family business in baptism, and your, your parents promise to help that happen. Do you promise to help your children grow in Christian faith and life? You know what they promised? You know what they said? I do. Uh-oh. I lost it. Crystal, can you help me get that back? 
after that, your godparents. Do you know who your godparents are? That'll be a little thing that you can, moms and dads, you can tell your kids who their godparents are if they don't know. The pastor of the priest said to the godparents, do you promise to help this person grow up in the Christian faith and life and community? And do you know what your godparents, your sponsors said to the pastor or the priest? They said, I do. And then the congregation. Congregation also makes a promise. That's us. Whether it was here or whether it was in another building, the pastor, the priest asks everybody else who's at your baptism, do you promise to support these people, these little ones, and pray for them in their new life in Christ? That means that people give money to this ministry and keep this ministry going, not just because they like church. They have instruments and furniture and buildings and staff and programs so that you can become more Christian. They promise to do their part. And they say, we do. So, not, I don't want to be superstitious about it, but I am still the dumb person who thinks that if you make a promise to God, you should keep it. And I know that sounds old-fashioned, but it's still important to me. And you have a chance for it to be important to you, too. That's why your parents have been <sighs> making you go to confirmation and made you go to Sunday school and make you do the altar service and make you do all those things. It's because they, took, they made a promise to God. And... They're trying to keep that promise. And now, you get a chance to take that promise over because you're growing up. And at some point, you become responsible for your own decisions. Your mom and dad can't make your decisions for you forever. And in the United States of America, you start making your own decisions when you're 18. But in the Christian church, you start making decisions for yourself and being accountable for your ethics and morality and faith. You become responsible when you say yes to the next vow. So this is what I will ask you on Halloween morning later this year. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism? To live among God's faithful people. That means, are you going to keep coming to church as a teenager? Are you going to keep coming to church as a college student? Are you going to keep coming to church? Are you going to make sure that there's a way for the church to be involved in your marriage? Uh, when you have kids of your own, are you going to do what you can to see to it that the faith is passed on to a next generation and they get baptized. You are promising, you are saying, I do, to living among God's faithful people. Hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper. That means come and listen to sermons and come and receive communion. And will you help the church to proclaim the good news of God in Christ with your words and your deeds? To serve all people, following the example of Jesus? And to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? That's a little different than uh, we want you to do, we want you to grow up and do whatever makes you happy. Happiness is good. It's very good. Uh, the message that comes from the movement of Jesus is a little different. It's not just your happiness. It's the renewal of the whole world. And Jesus is looking 
for folks to join the family business of helping the whole world experience that joy, justice, and peace. And here are the words that you will get to say if you want to. I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. If you want to say those words on October 31st, even if you don't know anything about Christianity, I will let you say them. I will, I will let you take that vow, and I will pray over you for this next season of your adventure with God. But don't be surprised if I don't see you on Christmas, post-pandemic, if you don't get a call. Hey, I thought you made a promise. You're going to keep that promise? You better get your butt to Christmas Eve and Easter at least, if not more frequently. If you don't want to say that, I will also stand by you, even if it really makes your mom and dad or grandma and grandpa mad. If you feel like you're not at a place where you're able to say that, you, you don't want to say it, I will also stand by you in that decision. So what I am asking from you is a fairly intense six weeks. Um, and what I am going to try to do in that six weeks is make sure that you know the basic, the basics of your religion. For those of you who are seventh graders, this will create a foundation that we'll be able to build on in confirmation next year when you're eighth graders. If you are an eighth grader, this will at least give you enough information that when you are representing Christianity and this congregation out in the world, you have some sense of what we stand for. So next Sunday, we are going to, uh, I am going to tell you the basics about who Jesus Christ is. You know, some of it is little things. Do you know what religion Jesus was? Do you know, uh, do you know what year we think Jesus was born? Do you know how long he lived? Do you know on what day he died? Do you know just some basic things? On April 25th, we're going to talk about Christianity as a whole. On May 2nd, we're going to talk about Luther and Lutheranism. This would be one of those simple things that it would be awesome if you would learn that the founder of this denomination is not the African-American preacher from mid-century, the 1960s, who led us through the civil rights struggle. So that Martin Luther and Martin Luther King Jr., are two different people. It's, it's important to know that. On May 9th, we'll talk about the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. That's the denomination uh, and the worldwide denomination that this church belongs to. On May 16th, we'll talk about atonement. And on May 23rd, that's the Sunday before uh, before Memorial Day weekend, uh, we will talk about you and uh, your commitment to participating in all of that faith that will have been described for you. You, you will not get through the next six weeks and know everything about Christianity. 
but you will get through the next six weeks and you'll at least know some basic things that every Christian should know if they are going to be a part of the church. But I am in a real, real quandary. We seem to be okay with Sundays. Uh, but one of the things I am discovering uh, with Pastor Julie leaving, uh, my workload has changed. Uh, and I am still trying to, to keep on top of everything. But I believe that it is important that the pastor personally oversee the process of confirmation, particularly since we've lost out on so much and we have to do this kind of intense time. I believe that the majority of you who responded to my email said that Sunday evenings were better than Sunday mornings. If that is true for you, if that continues to be true for you, would you raise your hand? Sunday evenings, okay. And sun, who are my Sunday morning preferers? And what about, uh, so Sunday morning would be at 11 a.m. So um, let me, so remember who you are. For those of you who prefer the morning, are evening gatherings a deal breaker for your family? Will it, like, will it just not be possible in any way, shape, or form? For evening families, is it a deal breaker if we had morning sessions? Everybody has some flexibility, okay? Um, I will email again in the week, early this week, I would imagine that we would be headed towards uh, a 6.30 p.m. gathering. Uh, and it's not forever. For those of you who are eighth grade families, uh, it's, it's just for the next six weeks uh, so that I can get this, get this stuff into your confirmand's brains. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, um, we can find some way to, to get them on track. But please keep in mind, I'm going to confirm them if they want to be confirmed, no matter what. I would like them to know some things, but I'm not going to be like the crusty old Irish priest and deny them access to that moment of grace because of my stuff. So I'll send out an email uh, to, to make that clear. Uh, we will have homework. So homework for next Sunday. So that means you need to do this this week. And I've got this on a piece of paper that I'll send out to you and I'll email it to. I want you to know your baptismal birthday. So parents, find those baptismal certificates. If you don't have the baptismal certificates, uh, then call the church office or call whatever church office. Find out what the baptismal birthday is and know it. Uh, and if you've got pictures or stories, show the pictures, tell the stories. Uh, let your confirmand know about that day that you made your promises. Uh, if you have a, a baptismal candle, uh, it's and you have never lit it before, you should get that bugger out, and uh, we'll put some mileage on it. Uh, so your confirmand should learn their baptismal birthday this week. There is a Jesus movie on YouTube called The Life of Jesus. Now, I want to warn you, as with most movies about Jesus, it is a little corny. Uh, but it does a really good job of giving you the picture of his whole ministry, okay? So I would be shocked to learn that you spend no time on YouTube 
during the week. That would be shocking to me because my kids watch YouTube more than they watch TV. So what I want you to do is I want you to start watching this movie and watch it, watch little bits of it over the coming days and next couple weeks. That's going to give you something visual because uh, I know that Bible reading is challenging, uh, but I want you to learn that. It's important if you are going to be a Christian that you know the story of Jesus' life. So watch that movie over the next couple weeks, and then I am going to be sending home an action Bible with you. The confirmands should know what this is. Uh, so one of the artists in, uh, who does like a lot of the Marvel comics uh, is a Christian man. And he decided that he wanted to use his talent to create a resource that would make scripture a little more accessible to younger folks. Uh, because Bible reading and biblical literacy has just plummeted over the last couple decades. So this is the Action Bible. It is a comic book Bible. And what I am going to do is I'm going to send one of these home with, with each one of you. And I'm going to have you read from page 523. That's the beginning of Jesus' life. To page 650. That is the day of his ascension. And I want you to have that read by April 24th. So that means you would read maybe about half this week, and you'd read about half next week. You might ask me, Ryan, why do I have to read Jesus' life in the Bible if I can just watch the movie of it? I want you to watch the movie because I want you to be able to get the big picture of his life all at once, because it's important for you to have that sort of lay of the land. But it is also important for you, especially if you are going to say yes in the Lutheran tradition, it's important for you as a young Christian to be reading a little bit of Bible every day. So it's not just about learning about the life of Jesus. I want you to begin to develop a habit. This may be a habit that your family has already taught you. Awesome. This may be a habit that your parents do not have. That's fine. But my job is to teach you the habit. So over the next two weeks, that's about, that's less than 10 pages a day. And when we talk about pages, you guys have seen this before. It's not like we're talking about oodles and oodles of text. Ten pages. Carve out a little time in the morning. Carve out a little time before bed. And just read ten pages a day. If Jesus died on the cross for you, you can read ten pages a day for him. All right? So I'm going to send one of these home with you. On your homework page that I have for you, uh, there is some, uh, a scripture passage there called the Great Commission. And the reason why church is here is because of this, this little command from Jesus. I want you to, I don't know, put it somewhere where you're going to see it and gradually commit it to memory. Do you know why I'm having you do that? One of the things Jesus said to his best friends the night before he died was that if you have my words, Jesus said, if you have my words, 
living inside of you, abiding in you, then I will come alive in you. And I want you to know that Jesus isn't just a statue. Jesus isn't just a subject in a book. He is alive and will come alive for you and in you. But it isn't just magic. He tells us that for that to happen, you have to have his words bumping around on your insides. So I want you to read that to yourself every day and do your darndest to somehow commit some chunk of it to memory. Okay? Uh, and then I'd like for you to take the pretest. This is not to make you feel bad about yourself. Moms and dads, this is not to make you feel bad about yourself. This is just a reality check uh, and something that can help us so that when we get on the other end of this fairly intense six weeks, your students are going to be able to look back and say, oh, I feel like I actually know something about Christianity that I did not know before. So the pretest is on here. Uh, I, th I would advise that the confirmand do this on their own without you looking over their shoulder. Uh, you're going to have an experience. I have that same experience as a parent. Uh, we had something. I don't remember if it was Sebastian or Alex the other day. And he, he made some comment, and I was like, well, you know that. What are you talking about? How could you ask that question? You're the minister's son. you got to know that. And he was like, I, I don't know it. It's uh, for Gen X parents. It is so weird to realize that now Christianity is not in the water the way it was when we were younger. Uh, and some of the things you would think that they would just already know, they don't know. Uh, so let them take the test. Uh, maybe you should take the test too. Uh, and just, just touch base with the reality of, of your household's knowledge of sort of some basic Christian stuff, okay? Not, now I'll warn you, there are all sorts of people out there who know all of these things and they're total jerks. So this, this knowing these things does not guarantee that you are a follower of Jesus. You can be a follower of Jesus and know none of these things. But remember, my job is try, to try to help you become disciples uh, and knowing this is a part of that discipleship journey. So take this little quiz, maybe take it later today. Uh, let them take it on their own uh, and uh, maybe have some conversation about it. And uh, I, I know that in the busyness of school and academics and the busyness of sports and other, you know, music lessons and other extracurricular activities, the church stuff seems like it can wait. But I want to make some sort of gentle witness to you that it is extremely important that our confirmand's souls start to exercise the faith because they're going to face some scary things. And that would be the case if the world was just hunky-dory. Uh, and by helping them begin to make this journey and get to their yes on confirmation day, we give them a chance to exercise their souls in such a way that when the hard times come, and they're going to come, they're going to have what they need to be able to make it through that. We want that. Uh, for our young people. But just like you have to practice that sport and just like you have to practice that instrument, you have to practice at Christianity. Or when you need it, sometimes your soul doesn't have the muscle memory to do what it needs to do in that moment. Uh, so let's, let's help them over these next few weeks 
uh, just to start to get an orientation to what it would be like for their souls to have that muscle memory. Okay, so I'm going to send you, um, and catechisms. Did Pastor Julie give you guys small catechisms? They're a little, they're a little book, kind of like that. You think so? Or no, no, not so much. Okay, we'll need catechisms. Um, how many of you work off of phones or tablets, confirmands? You can also download the Action Bible onto your phone or tablet. Uh, so that's, that's an option. Uh, and I, I will send out a link for you to download the small catechism onto your phone or tablet as well. We'll be using that. If, uh, and I will still be able to provide hard copies for that uh, as well. Questions for me? I know we've gone a long time already, so you're kind of like, oh man, please nobody ask any questions. But um, any urgent questions for me? Okay. Uh, so grab an action Bible on your way out. I, uh, grab a, a homework pretest page on your way out if you don't have one already. Uh, and I will send out an email confirming time and reminding you of homework this week. It'll be so much better if you do a little bit every day instead of waiting till next Sunday afternoon. So please, just a little bit each and every day. We want to get you developing that habit. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, I appreciate it. And now I'll send you out into your day. Um, and let's pray. God, we are so thankful for the young people who are represented in this room. We certainly know that our, our hope is in your son, Jesus. But one of the ways Jesus shows up best is uh, through the faith of young people, a next generation of Christians. We pray for this next generation of young followers of Jesus. We pray that over the next few weeks, they would come to know more about him, that his words would abide in them, and that his spirit would motivate them. Lord, give them what they need in their faith life to be able to say yes to joining the family business later this year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you.